Okay. Today I want to begin with an article that I pulled up. And the article is talking about, and ties into what we're dealing with here. We're talking about development. And when we speak development, we are generally concerned with resources. So this particular author gives us a breakdown on one of the reasons that there is a problem with development in Africa. The title of it is Africa's Abandoned Natural Resource, the Unity. Everything in the world revolves around Africa. From the Starbucks cachets to Apple iPad, Microsoft computers, Airbus aeroplanes, and the components of the Mars Curiosity Road, which is a uh, bit of technology built by the United States to send off to explore the Martian landscape. Even the resources employed by the National Aeronautics Space Agency of the United States to manage missions. All of these things are taken from Africa, though Africa doesn't get paid its true worth. This is a quote by Dario Thurston. Most importantly, there is no doubt that Africa still has in its possession a vast amount of untapped natural resources. Apart from the gold, diamond, copper, uranium, cocoa, and many other strategic natural resources which are still in abundance, there are plenty of oil and gas reserves in Africa that haven't officially been discovered. Though many of such discoveries were actually hidden until further colonial interests recently developed. Then he goes on to get into the fact that the one resource that Africa is missing, developing, is the youth. And I explained what Walter Ryan brought up yesterday that if you take away the youth from a country, and the youth are not developed, then that country won't be developed. And you remember Walter Reitman's example specifically had to deal with the fact that during the period of enslavement, European slave trade, they were removing the youth. They were removing the vital part of the economy. And when you do that, you destroy development. But if you look at the continent today, with every government, that's Samira Amini, we'll get into that in a minute, but as every government focuses in on external trade, in, uh, international trade or external economics, as opposed to internal economics, the focus then becomes on bringing in Western technology, things of that nature, but not developing the youth. And that is a very key point that we need to focus in on. That Africa's development is going to be based on its youth. You are the focus of the development of Tanzania. The youth of each African country are the focus of the development of that country. You are the focus. You are the key ingredient for the development of the continent. And if we overlook that, there will be no development. So if you start to looking at all of the development policies that are coming down, you will notice that for the most part, they ignore the youth. You see in the newspaper constant discussion about increasing foreign direct investment, increasing aid packages, all of these things, but no internal focus on the development of the primary resource, the youth. And this goes right back as we pick up with Walter Rodney to lead us into Amin, he tells us what was the focus of the colonial system? Economic exploitation. And they utilized private companies, you had the colonial state, all of them had one purpose, economic exploitation and impoverishment of Africa. Now today's topic is the subject matter of power, impoverishment, poverty assessment, poverty alleviation, and social reconstruction. And you will note, as we get deeper into this, that there is a reason that we have impoverishment alongside poverty. 
Because depending on how you define a given problem, that is going to affect how you go about trying to solve that problem. Walter Ryder goes on to tell us that. He says, how was this carried out? The purpose of the colonial government was to protect national interests against competition from other capitals. Therefore, they did not develop a capitalist class in Africa. <clears throat> the Germans didn't develop a capitalist class in Tanzania, neither did the British. No colonial power developed a capitalist class in any area of Africa. So that what developed as a capitalist class, or what you call capitalist class today, are really not capitalists. They're more of a comprador class, the parasitic. They are locked on and connected to the actual capitalist class, which is a foreign capitalist class. So that, see, a capitalist class is supposed to be able to finance development in a capitalist economic system. Capitalist class, or what's being called the capitalist class in Africa, can't do that. They don't have a financial basis to do that because they're basically just feeding the crumbs from foreign direct investment and from aid packages paid for that nature. Second purpose of the colonial administration was to arbitrate conflicts between the different colonies, different colonial capitals. So they dealt with their conflicts. And thirdly, they wanted to make sure that the environment for doing business was conducive to the interests of private enterprise, specifically private foreign enterprise. All right, one of the main purposes that they went about doing this, one of the ways they went about doing this, colonial taxation. The purpose of colonial taxation was, of course, getting blocked of the land. How do you do that? Well, you start requiring people to pay taxes on a number of different things to require that you got any money. Also, what did they do? They set up a police force and an army. Purpose of the police force and an army? To make sure that their, the police force is to deal with the day to day. Uh, regulation of people. So that's an internal occupation. And the army was set there, and you'll notice this is a common characteristic of all African armies. They are designed and they are trained when they send them to Fort Benning in the United States or when they go to the UK for training, they are trained not in external warfare, not for national defense. They are trained for internal control. And they have provided the weapons for internal domestic control. If you look at the weapons that are purchased by the military, they don't, they, they seldom have any real offensive capabilities. And that shows up, or would show up, if those countries were ever to engage in any type of military conflict with the advanced militaries in the world. So the military is set up for control. And then once they did all that, you seize the land. Once you take the land from people, people have no land, they are forced then to have to seek their sustenance within the colonial infrastructure by selling their labor. And that brings us into the issue so-called of poverty. Because traditionally, when you see persons teaching development, when you see these scholars writing about development, they focus in on the issue of poverty. <coughs> and so, you'll see all kinds of consciousness taking place in Tanzania talking about poverty alleviation. Well, first we have to assess the amount of poverty in the society, then we have to alleviate that poverty. But I'm not going to start the discussion with poverty. You see, whether you call it poverty, whether you define the problem, do you define the symptom as poverty, or you define the symptom as impoverishment? Those are just symptoms. We know you're sick because you're coughing. We know you're sick because uh, you're excessive sweating. You've got a fever. The fever isn't the problem. The coughing isn't the problem. They are merely symptoms of the problem. They let you know that there is a problem. If you say there's poverty, that's letting you know that there is a problem. It is not the problem. So if you attempt to solve 
or assess poverty and alleviate poverty, notice the word is not poverty, a solution to poverty. It says alleviation. I want to alleviate the pain in your feelings. I'm not going to get rid of the pain, I'm just going to alleviate it. I'm going to reduce the pain. So you see words like poverty, look at the word there. I have a book, it's called the Poverty Reduction Handbook. They want to reduce poverty, not a solution for it. See, when you have a problem and you go out and talk for a solution, you're solving, you're getting rid of the problem. But that's not what's being dealt with when they give you those terms. But beyond that, it is a symptom of a larger, it is a symptom of a very deep and large problem. Walter Rightly shows you how you get that problem. So we're going to go backwards. Because see, let's start with the definition for poverty. When we hear you talk about poverty, we're obviously comparing whoever we say is suffering from poverty, we're comparing them to something else, to someone else. So it's automatically inherent within the term that there is a comparison taking place. So, and then because when we deal with poverty and go to the word poor, we're dealing with the fact that there is some material within your society, and there are people within the society who do not have those materials, but they have those materials in small amounts. So if there is someone who is poor, they have very little, then there must be someone who has a great deal. Which takes you then into the whole issue of how is whatever there is to be distributed, how is it distributed? Whether you want to look at income or whatever. You want to look at the actual resource. That's what you're dealing with when you deal with the issue of poverty. So then, that, then by, by defining it as poverty, and the fact that some people have a lot and some don't, then you turn the focus within the society. You're automatically turn, going to focus on the society itself, once you say poverty. Because you said there are persons that are poor, so you say, well, if there are people that are poor in that society, then there must be people who have a great deal that are rich in that society. So your focus is inside the society. So then you begin to define everything associated with what you define as the problem of poverty. You define all of that from your perspective of inside that society. And you deepen, you now you can, when you begin to deal with the, what you define as the problem of being poverty, you decontextualize the entire issue. Everything has a context. You are who you are as a result of all of the groups you interact in. You will be who you will be as a result of all of the groups that you're going to be interacting in. As a result of the power relationships in those groups as a result of how you have defined yourself in relation to those groups. But when you focus in on poverty, you're inside of a society. So you've now said the issue of poverty in Tanzania is within Tanzania. And, the and you define poverty as a problem, so then the solution must be doing something within the society. You've decontextualized this from history. You've decontextualized it from global history. You've decontextualized it from the history of Tanzania. You, you've pulled it out of the context. You've decontextualized it from the global history and Tanzania's place within global history. You've decontextualized it from global economics, international economics. You've decontextualized it from the culture the culture within the country, the interaction of the culture within the country with the external cultures, so you've taken it out of context. You've now taken Tanzania and put it in a vacuum and defined the problem as internal to Tanzania, and then you begin to look for solutions to it, and you spend 50 years trying to solve the wrong problem, because that wasn't the problem. You know, so it's like you have, quote unquote, the flu, so you go to the you go to the pharmacy 
to get flu medicine, I mean, you go to the pharmacy, not the flu medicine, but you go to the pharmacy, the medicine to stop coughing, which is a symptom of the flu. So you just went, and so, you know, you stop coughing, and now, you know, you just, you just address that symptom. So you have some other things, you still have flu. And that's what happens when we take, have taken this issue by defining it as poverty. So now, now, when you even use the term poverty or impoverishment, which we'll get to, you automatically based it on some assumptions. See, you don't even deal with the issue of the word that I have, number one. You don't even deal with it, but you're dealing with it in your definition. You just start here. Power. And you have to contextualize everything within whatever the environment is. You have a continent, you have a regional environment that Tanzania interacts in. You have a continental environment that Tanzania acts in. You have a global, a hemispheric environment, a global environment that the country is interacting in. And if you're going to deal with the issue and actually solve the issue, you have to contextualize what you are dealing with. If if some, if you decided one day that maybe you need a psychiatric help because you have decided to acknowledge that you're crazy and you go to see a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist is going to begin by contextualizing you. They're going to want to look at your entire background, your social, the whole social environment that you're a part of. Because that all plays a part of you. So you have to contextualize the issue. Now, a few, few weeks ago, we looked at power from Amos Wilson. And I gave you the types of power. And you should have them written down somewhere. Just to come back and quickly review it, he told us that power is necessary. And we said biologically, when we kept, I keep bringing up, we mentioned the human body, you're an expression of power in development. As you grow, you increase in power. So you're an expression of power. So power is natural to every human being. And we said that one type of power was force as power. I'm going to force you to do something. We mentioned another type of power was coercion. Well, you know, I'll coerce you into doing something. Say influence was power. We stated that there was authority as power. So now, what, so anyway, manipulation adds power. So now, we're talking about power in its different types. So when we start to say force is power, and we look at the different ways that you can uh, manifest force as power, power as force involves the exercise of biological and physical means to prevent another person or group from going with you or it prefers to do, or to get something to happen to the person or group that he or it would prefer it did not. That's power as force. Now, it's inefficient because you've got to stand over the person the whole time. But remember, power as force is biological. So just as you can express power as force biologically by growing, Someone who maintains control of you biologically can stunt your growth and prevent you from growing. How do you stunt a people's growth? You get control of their food system. Once you get control of a people's food system, you open them up to five different types of hunger. We normally, when we speak of hunger, we think famine. You know, there's no food. But you know, you got four other different types of hunger out there. You've got protein, energy, malnutrition. And these other types of hunger, you look healthy, but you're suffering from these types of hunger. So once you get control of the food system, and then you get control of whether that person is deficient on protein, with so many other types of hunger, you stunt those that person growth. You stunt the person's growth. Now think back to what Walter Rodney told you about what the colonialists did, with the Germans, with the British, with the French, the Dutch, every European country on the continent, what they did when they came to Africa. 
they changed the agricultural system from being a self-sufficient agricultural system where the necessities of life were based in the extended family, they switched it to corporate or commercial agriculture. The growing of certain crops, monoculture crops, for the purpose of export. And people were left to fend as best they could in providing themselves with the basic necessity, you know, their, their, their dietary needs as best they could. They switched the system. When you switch the system, they set in motion all of the different types of hunger. We won't get into all of them today, but we'll look at those later. You set that in motion automatically, which means that you start to having, you start to producing children who are suffering from various aspects of malnutrition. That's another type of hunger. You set that in motion, and then that carries over from the early 1900s right through to today. Because even when there was political independence, it kind of stayed the same, so the problems of hunger stayed the same. The countries were still net exporters of agriculture, but because they still had a colonial agricultural system, economic system in place. So coming back to the issue of power, when you start to looking at a problem of the poverty or this impoverishment, once colonial society, once the uh, imperial societies took control of Tanzania, they automatically set them, put up, utilized force as power, took complete and total control of the biological and physical concerns of the people, and immediately set in motion a process of stunted growth. And remember, this was in a situation where you had all written, we had already gone through roughly a 400 year period of the slave, the European slave trade. So that's following on the backs of that. All right, that's now forces power can be psychic. So when these countries came in, now think about this: if you go back, there was no lack of. Uh, Self-respect, there was no lack of and respect in the skills of ourselves as African people. We knew exactly what we were capable of. But psychic violence, a form of power, when you take over of the information systems of a people, and then you substitute their image of themselves with your image of themselves. So that you get you create problems once you attack a person psychic. You know, you can get things to go up and just kill a person, shoot them, stab them, or whatever. But you're still killing a person when you attack them psychically, psychologically. You make them doubt their own abilities. You make them dislike their own appearance. You make them think that to be like you is the correct way. That's a psychic attack. We see it right across the continent today with skin bleaching creams and all porn. I was looking at a picture of a model, Naomi Kim, and it showed, you know, she's been modeling for a number of years, and she had, uh, as often used as the, um, the different chemicals to make her hair straight and limp like Europeans. And so in one of the pictures, it shows that her hairline was not where it should have been, but it was like way back here. And she stated that that was the result of having, you know, those chemicals and those weeds over all that period of time. That it was, it eroded the hammer, it's actually attacking the scalp, doing all kinds of damage. And remember, when we do these things, we go through pain to do it. You know, the chemicals that are placed on the head. All of that is a part of the psychic attack on us as Africans. The European beauty industry is built on African people all across the globe. Convince people that they're ugly and sell them stuff to make them look good. That becomes an entire industry, a billion dollar industry. Billions of dollar industry based upon our not liking ourselves as Africans. And so that you see baseball players like Sammy Sosa, uh, when I grew up watching him play basketball, he was a dark chocolate man. Now, 
feels like bleeds. The almost looks like pinkish, like the, 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 like a, the pig, the skin of a, a pig. It's horrible. And he swears he looks good now. And he was all smiling, it's like a, a, a freak show. But that business is based on our dysfunctionality. That's a, a part of the psychic power. Now, you might wonder, you say, well, how is this connected to either poverty or their poverty? I just told you, they have an entire industry that they built up, the beauty industry. And we are the key ingredient to that. We provide billions of dollars from the African continent, from blacks in the United States, from blacks in Brazil, billions of dollars to uh, the um, beauty industry, quote unquote beauty in, 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 in quotation, by the way. Billions of dollars. We could be putting that, those resources elsewhere, but we spend that to make ourselves look better. As if God made a mistake when God made you. That's all a part of psychic violence. So it's connected, economically. Our, our self-hate is directly tied into their economic system. That's psychic violence. Then, you have coercion and power, where I don't physically force, but I use my position, I use the respect you have for me as a way to get you to do it. You know, you have respect for me and I get you to do it because of that. You know, I just insinuate that I might do this if you don't do that. So I coerce you to do it. That's one form of coercion. Alright now, unlike force, coercive power actually functions by getting an agent to do something. You will actually go and do something as a result of that. Then there's influence. Influence occurs when a person acts in compliance with the wishes or directions of another because you really love that person. You see uh, influence as power in relationships. And how is this connected to poverty, the influence issue? You know, your respect for a people directly will lead you to want to be like them. You want to imitate them. You want to do the things that they do. Your respect for them will cause you to do that. And if that means you have to spend resources to do that, you'll go and do it. If you really respect that person, and then, you know, you start admiring them, you ask them to dress, where they look, and you'll start expending resources for those things. Next type of power is your so-called legitimate power. You that position that the person holds, you respect the position, so that's the power, and you're like, okay. So you automatically follow along with what they say because of that. Another form of power. Now, why is power important? Power is important for one reason. It is through your exercise of power that you go about, can move into the situation of developing your country. If you take control of your power. Now, you can see just from the types of power that I mentioned that power has an organizational base. Power is based in your national identity. It's based in the organizations that you're a part of. It's based in your consciousness. Consciousness is power. When you are conscious of who you are, when you are conscious of your abilities, your capabilities, when you have a positive identification of yourself, you can exercise that conscious power in the process of development. And that leads you to putting together the organization, the institution that you need to develop. It has to be based on self. See, if you have a great ethnic identity, you have a great biological identity, then suddenly you're not spending billions of dollars to lease the skin and buy clothes like the Europeans and do all of those things. Because whether you are aware of it or not, when you look at television and you see these the various styles, you automatically, and then you start saying, I like this or I like that, and you're not producing any of that, then you immediately go out and expend resources to get those things. The key focus of economics is on taste and desires. That's why businesses spend millions of, billions of dollars to convince you. They want to change your taste, change your desires. 
under the issue of power and the biological and physical control of the people. When, what, so one of the things colonialism did was change our personality, change our view of self. And when you do that, and then you, once you do those two things, you change personal tastes. You change personal desires. And when you change those desires into a desire that you can't satisfy, you take your resources and go. So you must begin the discussion with power. Now, poverty suggests that there's something in them, something internal to the society. And that's how you saw it. Impoverishment, which is a term, term that we also see Walter Rodney using, is something that happens from without. I can impoverish you. See, it looks like it's merely a semantical issue, but it is not. See, if you start to, if you look at this as impoverishment, you have now said that someone has created the issue of poverty. Someone has created this. Here, you said that the issue is internal to you. When you say impoverishment, you have now said that someone else has created the whole problem. Or someone or something has created the problem. So then you begin to look. You begin to get up and look for where is the cause coming from. Poverty makes you look inside of me. It's my fault. I didn't say it. If I had just understood you, you begin to blame yourself. There's a book by, uh, I think his name is William Ryan, the title of it is Blaming the Victim. And we can see examples of this in society. Um, some societies will use, uh, some, of the society, uh, some societies, if a woman is raped, they blame the woman. Well, she shouldn't have been out at that time. Well, she shouldn't have dressed that way. That's blaming the victim. A person is, you know, you see something terrible happened to the person, then you blame the person. Well, why did you do that? That's blaming the victim. So when you begin to define poverty, when you begin to look at things as poverty, you're blaming, you look internally. So you begin to blame self and you blame the society that you're in. When you deal with the issue of impoverishment, you are now looking for the cause. Basically, you said that this has been caused. Something created the situation. Something created the situation. And you understand it as a situation. By saying impoverishment, you've all automatically brought in the concept of power. Development is based on power. For there to be development, you must take back your conscious power. And have faith in your ability to build the type of society you want. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, um, you have talked about the power. <coughs> and uh, we have seen the psychological power and uh, also personal power and uh, conscious power. Now, my question is when you talk about power, are we, are we talking about muscle power or are we talking about ability of thinking power? We're talking about power in a psychological sense and power in its physical sense. Here's the connection. When we sit down and we say, think about you as an individual. Before you do anything, whether you're aware of it or not, you think. So if you're going to get up and get dressed, there's a thought process that goes with you. An example from the uh, mythological teachings from the Nile Valley gives it to you in the perspective of Ma'at in Jehuzi. And Ma'at, for the Africans of the Nile Valley, just a, a short abbreviation, this was the concept of balance, harmony, reciprocity, a give and take type of relationship. It also, uh, was used as a symbolizing of thought. Specifically, right thought. The correct type of thinking. Now, 
we complement to this with genuity. Which was the the uh, your actual carrying out, the actual doing of whatever the thing is that you were going to do, or right action. So if we go back to what the ancestors are telling us, first off, they're saying that first, because in that educational system when we discussed the other day, I mentioned the first thing was you had to have control of thought. That was number one. Number two was control of action. If you control the thought, you control the action. So when we're talking about power, we begin first with your conscious power, your thinking power. When you have control of your consciousness, then your physical actions are going to follow that. If I have control of your thinking, your consciousness, I have control of your physical actions. Carter G. Woodson says, you don't have to stand over a person with a gun. Carter G. Woodson is an uh, African diaspora historian. If you ever get a chance, I have a copy of this book electronically. He has a book that's called The Miseducation of the Negro, and he wrote it in 1933. And a quote from the book says this. He says, you, that when you control a man's thinking, you control that man. You don't have to stand over the person with a knife or a gun and force them to do anything. You don't. Because you control their thinking, you control the ideas in their head, you control the culture in their head. If that person has been taught to enter a room through the back door, and they come to your house and there is no back door, they will build a back door so they can enter. So conscious power is key. Control that thinking, and then the action goes with it. So here, we are specifically talking about both of them. Notice Dr. Wilson's definition was biological power, and this, he said the biological and the physical, and then he moves into the conscious. Power has a social base. How you organize the society determines your power relationships. Relationships. For us as Africans, everything is based on the relationship. We understand the power issue. So we designed the relationships. Originally, they were based in this manner, on ma'at, which is harmony, balance, the word reciprocity, which means I shall give that which I want to receive. That was the nature of our relationships. So that when you look at now Valley civilizations and they wanted to give you an example of social balance and you look at the statues they built, their example of social balance was the couple, the man and the woman. But the way they did it was completely different from the way Europeans do it. Because when they built the statue, they didn't have the man supporting the woman. They had the man standing with his foot slightly forward, and they had the woman standing next to the man, her one hand on this arm, her other hand around his back, because they were telling you that the pillar, the support, the foundation of the society was the woman. So that when you went to Mount Valley civilizations, the economy was controlled by the women. And it wasn't that they were saying that woman was superior to man, a man was superior to woman. They were saying that both are equal and their roles are equally important. When I gave you the example from Malawi, I mentioned to you that the uh, former president, the one who died in office, I forgot his name again, he said that if he was going to help Malawian agriculture, he had to subsidize the women because the majority of the agriculturalists across the African continent are women. If you really want to develop a country, you have to start with the women. If you, if you start with the women, if you put them in the finances and the resources in the women's hand, you've done two things automatically. Taking care of the women and the family. If you put the resources into the hands of the man, you're going to create some issues. The man is disconnected. Most of the work that the man does is outside and away. 
Even today, we still maintain the families are still developed and controlled and directed by the woman. All right, so that's when we say power. We are specifically talking about the conscious power and the physical power. So now, when you look at the issue of power, and then you begin over here with impoverishment, you automatically now, you are now getting closer to the definition of what the power, the problem is. You define the problem as power, so you want to, I mean, as poverty, so they were trying to assess the degree of poverty and then alleviate it. But now, once we have said that we have an issue of impoverishment, that someone or something has caused this poverty, we've now brought in the concept of power, and we have defined our problem as the fact that we do not have conscious and physical power. You take back your conscious and physical power, and everything then begins to move in the direction you want it to. Let's use Egypt right now as an example. It's a hill square of the protest because Morrissey has engaged in a power grab. And you see that they all have congregated in the Tahir Square. It is there, protesting. And then the, 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 the uh, riot squad comes in, they shoot some you know, tear gas and you know, all kinds of things like that. But if you really wanted to exercise, that's not an exercise of power, by the way. Yes, there are protesting. But it's not an exercise of power. You see, an exercise of power, when you don't have, you, you've analyzed your resources and you understand that you don't have a monopoly of physical force, military police, then you have to utilize the power resources you do have. If you want to make the government do what you want them to do, you don't go to the government house and protest and, and throw rocks and, and scream and call people names and burn stuff. You shut down the society. You go to the key arteries of the society. You know, you get your arteries in. If I take a knife and I slice just the right artery, you just leave this. You know, if I just take a knife and just touch it right under here, I don't care how big and strong you are. You're going to collapse and you're going to be like, you're going to start getting killed and weak and collapse down and what did I do? I just, I just took some 10th grade biology and I learned in 10th grade and took you out. See, when you see me like me, you have to figure other ways of dealing with the person that you might encounter. If you ain't going to beat them physically, so you got to have them. Anyway, when you want to force a government to do what you do, in a real democracy, when you have a representative democracy and you can let people into office and you want to make sure they do what you want them to do and they don't do, you don't go and just protest aimlessly. You shut down the society at its key artery, at its key points. For example, say you got the International Airport. You go and you block the runways. Massive violence. You block the runways. No plane land, no plane take off. You block the major arteries in the society as far as the uh, movement of vehicles. You shut down communication in the society. That, my friends, is called civil disobedience. That is an exercise of your power resource, your massive numbers. In any society, whoever has power generally is in a minority. It's only a handful of them. There's not that many of them. If we use China as an example, the Chinese have 200, I mean, 2 million men under uniform, or more than that, but they got 2 billion people. So, I don't care how many guns you have, the, the key resource is the people. They have to strategically place the military in order to deal with when, when the people decide they want to protest. Because they know all 2 billion aren't going to come out. But if you have an organized mass organization, that calls the people out when necessary, that changes the power relationship. Because, see, now you have engaged in conscious power by thinking of what your situation is, and then you have come up with a solution that best utilizes your number one resource, your massive numbers. So anyway, we understand the issue of power. But now, we're dealing with development, or underdevelopment. 
which leads us into Samir Amin's book, Maldevelopment Anatomy of a Global Failure. Now, in his book, he opens up in the notes section, he tells us what he's going to be looking at. He says he's going to give you a political analysis of the issue of development. Why does he give you a political analysis? Once you bring, normally when people talk about development, they're talking about economics. And they kind of miss, and because you talk about economics with macroeconomic schemes, macroeconomic theories, you start making numbers. But if you do a political analysis or a political economic analysis, when you connect politics and economics, political economy, and they're supposed to be connected, then you've automatically brought in the, the issue of power. And you begin to then properly address the problem as one of power. And so that's what he goes on and he says he's going to do. He looks at the logic of power. I mean, yes, the logic of power, the modes of power. Marxist scholars, they often will talk about the modes of production. And they, they break society down to the modes of production, the class conflict. But there is also an issue of power. you got different modes of power. I just gave you an example. When you think power, you think government. But then I just told you that you have social power. The organization of your numbers and the distribution of those numbers in key places in society, not for a few moments, but indefinitely. When a society can't function, when you shut down the society at its key political points, at its key social points that allow for economic functioning, you automatically get the ears and force people to do what you want them to do. That's civil disobedience. All right, now he says that development fails. I say development did not fail. Africa, there has not been a failure of development. No. Development is occurring exactly as it's supposed to occur. Because the colonial system engaged in a particular type of development. Arrested development. If you go to psychology, you see the term arrested development. So it's a development. For example, if you're arrested, if you suffer from arrested development, perhaps you've got stunted growth. Maybe you're supposed to be six feet tall and 200, and maybe 200 pounds, or, or like 70, 80, 90 uh, kilograms, something like that. You're supposed to be there, but something has happened: poor diet, malnutrition, all of these things. So instead of being six feet tall, maybe you're five feet tall. Instead of being 90 kilograms, maybe you 40 kilograms. That's arrested development, stunted growth. Something has occurred. If you put it in its context and you look at the economic and food basis, agricultural basis to colonialism, you can see that they didn't, they didn't, uh, there is no underdevelopment. You, or then there is development as well. You can develop it exactly as the system requires the development for what it needs. Western society needs this to be a place to ship out money and natural resources. That's exactly what it is. That's the type of system that they have developed. Now, Samir Amini, though, he brings in the concept of maldevelopment. He says because it's an issue of maldevelopment because your condition is based on someone else's condition. And by giving a political analysis, he provides you with the issue of power. Understanding the power relationships that are going on in the current. And when he talks about what the solution is, he uses a wonderful term in his book. Delinking. He uses the term delinking. Now, this is, a, this is just a quick outline of what he, of uh, Samir Amin's breakdown of what's going on. He says, under development is not a lack of development, it is the reverse side of development in a rich country. The United Kingdom, who is a major trading partner with Tanzania, needs Tanzania to be exactly as it is in order for the United Kingdom to be the rich country that it is. Or it has defined itself as being. 
a bad enough to say define itself as these. Now, so what you have is a system of capitalist expansion, accumulation. He says that throughout history, capitalism constantly expands, and that mainstream economics simply gives you theories on the management of that expansion. And it doesn't talk about the social conflicts that that expansion leads to. Because since its expansion is based on the male development here, that leads to social conflict in this area, not in this society. So it's like here, you get the conflict and the impoverishment, and then when you go to the UK, the US, you see the fruits of development. All right, he tells us that there's an unequal exchange is the main characteristic of capitalism. He says development in poor countries tends to be a development of underdevelopment. Countries continue to get poorer and poorer even though they produce more and more. He says the world is divided between the rich, the rich countries who are the center of everything and the poor countries who are the periphery. They're on the outside. He says that in addition, whereas wages in rich, you say when you have wages or what you're paid for your work in rich countries, they go up. That's not what happens to wages in a poor country. He tells us that the global market um, doesn't pay people equally. The same job, say, for instance, a person is a, a teacher in Tanzania, you're getting paid significantly lower than a teacher in the United States. A teacher in the U.S. is making probably what your low-level government officials are making in Tanzania. And a teacher in the U.S. is considered poorly paid. So he says wages aren't the same. He says that the agrarian sector dominates in poorer countries, but they can't really develop it because they don't have a real capitalist class. All right, you've got economic distortions. The global market leads to problems in production. You might see some poor countries that are the economic miracles, but he says in reality, that's not the case. Capitalism is primarily filled with a few of the so-called miracles, and for the most part, everything else is problems. So you got a lot of countries that don't grow, they just stagnate, and you got blockages. All right. And then he says, poor countries pay for their own exploitation. For instance, profits from any energy company, I'm using energy because it's just, uh, you got new energy deposits discovered off the coast of Tanzania within the country. So when those companies come here, uh, their profits are going to be invested in American, French, UK banks, American, UK, French government debt, is going to be extracted through the profits of foreign oil firms, and they're going to finance the recolonization of the country. And then you've got those countries that have a dominance over natural resources, and they have a dominance in military technology, and so you've got a relationship similar to a boss and a worker within the country. Those are some of the ideas that some mean Attention. And he says, when you talk about delinking, it's defined as this. You don't focus on international economics or international trade. You focus on internal development. That becomes the primary focus of the all economic issues. Not trying to get foreign companies to direct in the country, but you focus on the development of the country internally. By going back to the three basic things we talked about in the very first day we got together. You look internally and you develop the industries, of, the textile industries for clothing. You develop your construction industries for providing sustainable, adequate housing for all citizens. You focus in on food, the food system. And we must. And now, he's, now one of the things that they'll tell you is that well, we need to have commercial agriculture in order to develop the, the country. But one of the uh, scholars 
came to Tanzania and he did an English language version of his book. The title of the book is Why Are They So Poor? And one of the things he tells you is that first off, if you're going to develop a country, you need to have land reform. He says some countries like Tanzania do not suffer from this problem since they have more or less kept their traditional systems of communal ownership of land. But many countries didn't keep the system. Under Ujamaa, they kept the system. Under the current neoliberal policy, they're trying to get rid of it, sell off the system. Communal ownership of land is a problem for corporate companies, for foreign uh, investors. All right. He says you have to have land reform in most of those these different countries. He says land reform is an important precondition for abolishing hunger and rural poverty. Land reform is the redistribution of land by a law which takes land from those who have too much of it and distributes it to those who have too little or no land at all. The first thing he tells us that it must be done. Then he goes on to tell us another thing that must occur as far as development is concerned. He said development in countries like Tanzania has got to be based on agriculture and on the stages of production preceding and following. Right now they want you to go into agro industry where you have a bank giving money to the World Bank, financing the chemical industry, then you get some people who come in and plan the agriculture, you bring in the big uh, agricultural companies and their technology, and then you ship the food to the world market. That's not how you develop. When you develop, you start developing your blacksmith industry, your tailors, your carpenters, your joiners, and your builders. Those are the people who provide the stuff you need for agriculture. Those are all jobs. Then you have the farmer who buys all of that stuff from those persons. He goes out, he plants the crops, and does things of that nature using human labor. You don't need technology when you've got a surplus of labor. And then, after that, And so what he says is, you need the other industries as the other aspect of it. You need a mill, the butcher, the tanner, the cheese maker, and the weavers. Those are the other industries. When you put all of those together, that leads you to development. And we'll pick up with Samir Amin next Tuesday. Any questions? I'll see you next Tuesday.